Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Al-Qaeda organization in the land of two rivers, which claimed responsibility for the kidnapping of two Algerian diplomats, published a videotape of the two hostages on an internet website. The tape did not include any demands, but the authenticity of the website has not been confirmed yet. I'm Ali Bel Al Arusi, charged the affairs of the Algerian Embassy. على شبكة الإنترنت رسالة تعطي الدليل على أن الدبلوماسيين الجزائريين علي بل عروسي وعز الدين بالقاضي ما زال على قيد الحياة وفي صحة جيدة. خاصة وأن الأخبار السابقة تداولت إصدار حكم بالإعدام من قبل تنظيم القاعدة. What will happen next after these images appeared on international TVs and internet? These images indicate that the two Algerian diplomats, Ali Belarusi and Azadine Belqasi, are still alive and in good condition. This is important, this is important, especially when considering that earlier news reports said that Al Qaeda organization has sentenced them to death. These developments clarify some of the ambiguity concerning the kidnapping of the two Algerian diplomats. They were only on a symbolic mission in the land of the two rivers because of the limited number of Algerians living there. The two Algerian diplomats were transported to unknown destination by armed men in the middle of the day, last Thursday. They were only 100 meters away from the Algerian embassy in Al Mansur neighborhood in Baghdad. The Algerian authorities formed a committee within the foreign ministry immediately after receiving the shocking news. The two hostages were purely sent to fulfill administrative duties. Algeria is still committed to respecting the unity and sovereignty of Iraq, in addition to the historical ties and brotherhood between the Iraqi and Algerian people, which explains why the Algerian and Iraqi people strongly condemn the incident, both at the political and civilian levels. This shows that both Arab and international communities are in solidarity with Algeria. Earlier, news reports indicated that the kidnappers wanted to execute the Algerian hostages, but for several reasons, Algeria still has hope that they will be returned home safely. Most importantly, the two hostages are not responsible for what's happening to all the Iraqis. The Algerian efforts to bring back the hostages have not stopped. Not to mention, every free and fair human being hope that Ali bin Arusi and Ezzeddin bin Qasi will be released. The Algerian people are extremely worried about the latest developments in the Algerian hostages, condemning the incident and demanding that the hostages be released quickly. We, the Algerian people, have good relations with our brothers in Iraq. God willing, they will hear our calls and return the Algerian brothers to their countries. This is not acceptable to Islam. I'm confident that the hostages will come back to their homeland, God willing. We hope that those who kidnap the Algerian hostages let them come back safely to their families. We, the Algerian people, are standing firm behind them. Ongoing violence, gunmen attacked two buses carrying employees of a water project west of Baghdad, killing 12 and injuring nine. Also, two Iraqis, one of them a woman, were killed while six others were injured in clashes between gunmen and Iraqi security forces west of Mosul. In Beji, mortar bombs killed one Iraqi and injured three. Gunmen also killed Brigadier General Ali Kamil al Jabouri from the disbanded Iraqi army in Shirkat, north of Baghdad. Al Jabouri was killed late last night while on his way home. In Baquba, gunmen shot dead Al Mahdi army official Sheikh Saad Yunus al Difai while he was in a car repair shop. 
in Kirkuk, two roadside bombs exploded, seriously wounding an Iraqi officer. The first bomb went off near the house of Lieutenant Colonel Ali Hussein of the Iraqi army. The second exploded near an Iraqi police convoy, which was on the way to the scene of the first attack. Has a Gaza pullout draws closer around 5,000 Israeli police and soldiers have started a two-week intensive training to evacuate 21 Gaza settlements and four in the West Bank on August 17th. Evacuation squads have been divided into 17 member units, all unarmed, that will enter the settlements of red-roofed houses built on occupied land to tell settler families to leave. Defense Minister Shaul Mafaz, who was watching the exercise at the Zelem base, said authorities would officially notify the settlers on August 15 that they had 48 hours to leave voluntarily or face removal. The timetable of uh, the implementation of the disengagement plan is uh, between uh, mid-August uh, uh, until uh, the end of uh, September and we will implement it uh, accordingly to the decision of uh, the government of uh, Israel and the parliament of uh, the state of Israel. Palestinian Prime Minister Ahmed Qurair warned against Israel taking unilateral steps in the West Bank following its withdrawal from Gaza. He told a cabinet meeting in Ramallah that any unilateral policies will be rejected. Also in Ramallah, members of the Palestinian health sector gathered outside the Legislative Council calling on the government to improve their working conditions, including an increase in salaries. Meanwhile, lawmakers met to discuss the delayed legislative of elections that were scheduled for this month. A session was held to vote on modifications to the basic law which will allow changes to be made to the election law in order to have legislative elections as soon as possible. Once the law is passed, President Mahmoud Abbas will announce a date for the legislative elections after coordinating with the election committee which is responsible for the arrangements. British Prime Minister Tony Blair has said the terrorists should not be given one inch as he works towards a political consensus on new anti-terror legislation. As police intensify their hunt for would-be bombers three weeks after the death of more than 50 people in the London train bombings, Blair is trying to get an agreement on tougher anti-terror legislation, calling on opposition leaders to plot the best way forward. Opposition leaders have agreed on the need for a consensus but have voiced reservations over legislation that would allow for suspects to be held without charge for three months. In continued investigations, police earlier found material for making explosives at a house connected to one of the suspects wanted over attempts to set off bombs on three underground trains and a bus on July 21st. The flat on the ninth floor of a 12-story tower block in New Southgate, North London, is believed to have been used as a bomb factory by the suicide team who unsuccessfully targeted the London Transport Network last Thursday. There is no justification for suicide bombing, whether in Palestine, Iraq, in London, in Egypt, in Turkey, anywhere. And we are not going to deal with this problem, with the roots as deep as they are, until we confront these people at every single level. China has sounded an optimistic note on the first day of the six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear program. China's spokesman to the talk said delegates were serious and practical as the delegates pushed ahead with the negotiations. While few expect a breakthrough this week, the atmosphere ahead of the fourth round of discussions between the two Koreas, the United States, Russia, Japan and China, has been upbeat. At the opening session, the U.S. side gave North Korea reassurance that it viewed the North Korea as a sovereign state which it would not attack. North Korea responded by expressing hope hopes for progress on denuclearization. The Chinese spokesman said the talks indicated a positive outcome was possible, but said an end date for the talks had still to be set. Despite the upbeat signals, distrust is still great. Three previous rounds saw no progress, and Japan Japanese top negotiator Kenichiro Sasai said failure to gain concrete results this time would call the credibility of the talks into question. As the nuclear talks resume, the UN Food Agency warned 
warned that North Korea's already severe food crisis could deteriorate as a combination of rising food prices and scarce international aid threatens basic supplies. A Dutch court has sentenced the self-confessed killer of a Dutch filmmaker to life in jail for a religiously motivated murder which whipped up racial tension in the Netherlands. Mohamed Boyeri, an Amsterdam-born Muslim, was convicted of killing Theo van Gogh as he cycled to work in Amsterdam last year. He was found guilty of shooting and stabbing van Gogh, slashing his throat and pinning a note to his body with a knife. Van Gogh, a descendant of the brother of the 19th century painter Vincent Van Gogh, was known for his outspoken criticism of Islam and angered many Muslims by making a film which accused Islam of condoning violence against women. Judge Udu Willem Bentecht told the court Boyeri a devout Muslim had murdered Van Gogh in a gruesome manner and showed no remorse. He said the murder had terrorist intent. The 27-year-old Boyeri confessed to the murder during his trial earlier this month saying he had been motivated by his religious convictions. Fighters in attacks in the central province of Uruzgan. An Afghan provincial governor said a major Taliban ammunition depot was destroyed during the fighting yesterday and 25 Taliban guerrillas were captured. Also in Afghanistan, hundreds of people staged a protest against U.S. forces outside the main U.S. base in the country after the arrest of three local villagers. U.S. soldiers fired shots in the air after some protesters threw stones at military vehicles entering Bagram Air Base north of the capital, Kabul. Police said the protesters were complaining that American troops entered a house in Bagram village to arrest the men without permission. Violence surged in Afghanistan ahead of parliamentary elections in September. Fugitive Taliban leader Mullah Muhammad Omar urged supporters to unite against the Afghan government and U.S.-led forces ahead of the election. Warlord Samir Jaja, the only leader from the 1975 to 1990 civil war, was ever jailed for his alleged crimes, walked free from a military prison under an amnesty this morning, and headed straight for a flight out to Europe. The release of Jaja, a veteran opponent of neighboring Syria, once allied with Israel, came after Damascus ended a three decade troop deployment in its neighbor in April, paving the way for Lebanon's first elections since the war, war free of Syrian troops. Edith Karam has a story. Smiling and relaxed, Samir Jaja addressed the crowds of supporters from his Lebanese forces movement who had gathered at the airport to celebrate his freedom after more than 11 years in jail. In a barely veiled reference to Syria's long domination of Lebanon, Jaja said, quote, you've been freed from a big prison and that's what's that enabled me to be released from this little prison. He spoke of his long ordeal in a defense ministry prison where he was held in solitary confinement in a deep basement cell until last autumn, describing the experience as being very, very hard. Jaja said to applause from the crowds of some 350 well-wishers who had gathered in the airport's VIP lounge to salute him. He never felt that he was in custody because his, quote, soul remained free. Jaja paid tribute to the Maronite Patriarch Cardinal Nasrallah Boutros Sfer for his role in securing his release, in addition to Druze leader and wartime foe Walid Jumblat, as well as Sunni leader Saad Hadidi and MP Michel Aoun and his Free Patriotic Movement. He also saluted the people of Lebanon, Christian and Muslim, for their struggle for the country's survival and their efforts for his release. Jaja spoke out against the aggressions that continue to strike Lebanon, a reference to a wave of nine bloody bombings that have hit the country since the February assassination of Hadidi's father, Rafiq, a five-time former prime minister. Jaja's wife, Strida, who won election to parliament last month as part of her campaign for her husband's release, was expected to travel with him to Europe, where he was to undergo medical tests lasting several weeks. Lebanese forces officials declined to reveal the exact destination for security reasons, but Lebanese media said he would head to Geneva. It was not clear, however, when he would return. Tight security surrounded his release and journalists were kept away from the prison. An amnesty law pardoning Jaja was approved by parliament last week and published in the official gazette on Thursday. The anti-Syrian bloc of prime minister designate for Adi Senora included the Lebanese forces in its election-winning alliance and campaign for Jaja's release. Jaja was cleared of a 1994 bomb attack on a church that left 11 dead, but was handed four death sentences, all later commuted to life imprisonment for offenses during the war. 
war, notably the 1987 killing of Prime Minister Rashid Karame. The Lebanese forces leader has always proclaimed his innocence, portraying himself as having been victimized for his staunch opposition to Syria. Many Maronite Christians viewed his imprisonment and the 14-year exile of ex-general Michel Aoun as symbols of a Syrian desire to penalize and sideline their once dominant community. Aoun returned in May just before Lebanon's first election after the Syrian withdrawal. Jaja, who fought bloody battles with Aoun's forces in the last stages of the civil war, was a hero to many Maronites, but was regarded by many Muslims and some Christians as a dangerous Israeli-allied firebrand wedded to Maronite supremacy. <laughs> Security forces have put the finishing touches to their operational plans for evacuating Israeli settlements in Gaza and in northern Samaria. More and more members of the government and the defense establishment are asking that the evacuation be speeded up and be carried out in one continuous action rather than in four stages as originally planned. Disengagement Administration Chief Yonatan Basi and Director General of the Prime Minister's Office, Ilan Cohen, today toured the Negev sites that will be used to house the Gush Katif evacuees. Basi said the evacuees will be provided with social workers and psychologists to assist them during the difficult process of disengagement. Cohen told reporters that 40% of the Gaza families have already contacted the disengagement authority. Bossi said the discussions with the evacuees are emotional and tearful. He revealed that several settlers slated for evacuation have threatened to harm themselves if they are not moved together with their current communities. Bossi said 160 families will be able to move into temporary housing in Nitsan near Ashkelon beginning August 1st. The head of IDF Southern Command, Major General Dan Harrell, says the Army is preparing to complete the evacuation of the Gaza settlements in three weeks. Addressing the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, Harrell said the pullout will begin in the north of Gaza and proceed southward. General Harrell said that Israel failed to protect its citizens when Rachel and Dov Kol were murdered by Palestinian terrorists in Gaza on Saturday night. He warned that if Palestinians attack during the Gaza pullout, Israel will raid Palestinian towns in the area. On the issue of IDF soldiers refusing to obey orders to evacuate settlers, RL said the soldiers are being subjected to relentless pressure bordering on intimidation by the settlers designed to incite them against their superior officers. The committee condemned recent remarks settlers made about Harel, calling him a traitor and a murderer. This is intolerable, several Knesset members said. Harel responded by saying IDF soldiers are working day and night to protect the citizens of Israel. The right to protest is legitimate, he went on to say, but it's important to maintain a level of national responsibility even at painful moments. Defense Minister Shaul Mofaz today told a press conference in Tel Aviv that the evacuation of settlements in Gaza will take between two weeks to one month. Mofaz also said the Palestinian Authority is cooperating with Israeli officials regarding the pullout from Gaza. Meanwhile, Defense Minister Mofaz last night met with Palestinian Authority Interior Minister Nasser Yusuf. He called on the PA to apprehend the people responsible for organizing the attack at Kisafim Junction on Saturday night. Yusuf asked Mofaz to ensure that PA security forces be allowed to carry weapons during the disengagement. Knesset Speaker Ruvain Rivlin, once among the most ardent supporters of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, is turning into his most ferocious critic. Today, after telling a radio interviewer that the Prime Minister appeared to be losing control, Rivlin convened a meeting of Likud and Labour Knesset members in his office. Rivlin criticized Sharon for delaying construction of a new neighborhood linking Jerusalem and the town of Male Adumim. Among those invited was former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. It was just two days ago that Prime Minister Sharon, without naming Rivlin, complained about one particular Knesset member who, quote, stands and squawks that I, Ariel Sharon, am about to partition Jerusalem, even though he knows it's a lie. Last night, addressing Likud activists in the town of Afula, Sharon charged that certain elements were using extreme incitement in an attempt to split the Likud from within. The Prime Minister was interrupted sporadically by disengagement protesters holding up orange flags. Moving to international developments, since Sharon said he expects London Mayor Ken Livingstone to apologize for comparing Israel's Likud party to the Hamas terror group. 
Sharon said Hamas is a murderous organization that killed thousands of Israelis. Such anti-Semitic comparisons are inappropriate, and European governments should address them. French police have detained a 15-year-old boy and questioned two other youths in connection with a weekend attack on a Jewish school in Paris. Today, French Interior Minister Nicolas Sarkozy toured the school with, and visited with some of the students. Sarkozy said, threatening a school is unacceptable and anyone who threatens a Jew threatens the French Republic. On Saturday, vandals tossed a bottle filled with hydrochloric acid into a part of the school which serves as a synagogue. No one was injured in the attack. Following a rise in anti-Semitism, the French government passed stiffer penalties recently for those convicted and two years ago initiated a program that encourages school trips to Auschwitz. Later this week, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon will travel to France for high-level talks with French leaders. The Islamic Council in the area of Lyon in France announced that one of the Algerians who was expelled from France was not carrying out religious activities that an imam would do. Rather, he was only giving some sermons in a small mosque where some worshippers prayed. France already deported two imams considered to be extremists, and it is believed that one of them was linked to an attempted attack on a train in 1995. The deportation decision came a few days after the Interior Minister Nicolas Sarkozy threatened to deport extremist imams and strip them of their French citizenship if they incite violence. This man, the French interior minister, is waging a war against what he calls radical imams. The minister is not speaking without substance, but he is relying on a report by the French intelligence agency indicating the presence of Salafi imams that are taking advantage of mosque pulpits to publicize fundamentalist views. The fingers of accusations are pointing to imams from North Africa and Turkey, and the minister, Sarkosa, has reiterated that they should be deported immediately. We are only confronting extremist imams that call for hate and violence and do not respect the principles of democracy. We will deport these imams from France and deport them quickly. However, the imams that respect the principles of the Republic, they are welcome in France and it is everyone's right to practice their religion. The threat of expulsion was quickly implemented when a French imam of Moroccan descent was deported. He was accused of belonging to a terrorist group. A number of imams are awaiting a similar fate since the French security intelligence agency described them as spiritual leaders urging Muslims to carry out suicide operations in Iraq. Leaders in the Muslim community did not oppose this campaign, but they warned of negative consequences. It is a sort of extremism in the sermons given by some imams, but this needs to be handled legally because we do not want to over publicize this, because then people think that all imams are like this and this is very wrong. Despite encountering reservations about the strict policies toward extremists, France intends to introduce new legal and administrative laws to facilitate the expulsion of radical imams, adding more anti-terrorism and security measures. We need to clean France. We can never accept the use of France as a base to prepare terrorists. I am asking for stricter measures. France knows the Arab world very well and will not confuse religion, extremism and Islam. Theory that the war against radical imams will transform into a campaign of racism against foreigners, human rights organizations came out of their silence, warning the authorities not to confuse a handful of extremists with the main stream moderate Muslims. It is normal for the government to move against security dangers. However, there is no reason to point the finger only towards Muslim imams because they do not pose more of a threat in France than other religious leaders. 
Today, France has more than 2,000 places of worship, especially mosques. French security agencies say that they have been monitoring 20 extremist imams. This is a large number in the eyes of those who want to take advantage of the opportunity and give the entire French Muslim community a bad reputation. عودة إلى الشأن الفلسطيني ولكن من النافذة الاجتماعية حيث نظمت حركة الجهاد الإسلامي بالتعاون مع رابطة مساجد غزة عرسا جماعيا احتفلت The Islamic Jihad Movement organized a group wedding of 122 Palestinian couples in coordination with the Gaza Mosque Coalition. The aim of the initiative is to help young men and young women get married despite the problems caused by unemployment and poverty. The weddings brought happiness to many Palestinians despite the Israeli killings and assassinations. بعيدا عن اجواء الحزن والالم والتوتر جاب شوارع مدينه غزه الاف الفلسطينيين يمثلون 444 away from the atmosphere of sadness and pain thousands of palestinians came to celebrate with 440 families the weddings of 122 couples this time huge crowds were not gathered to participate in the funeral procession of a martyr rather the occasion was for a group wedding this brought happiness and joy to the hearts of all the people that were attending I wish that the Jews withdraw from our city. We would be much happier. God willing, when we do another group wedding, there will be no Jews or settlers. All the people will be happy. This would make people very happy. The grooms were seated on a large platform that was well prepared on a large square in the center of Gaza City. Brides were represented by young bridesmaids. Happiness was apparent on the faces of the people who were celebrating, as well as their families. This large wedding reflected the unique Palestinian national unity. Yes, the Islamic Jihad movement and the Gaza Mosque Coalition have organized this large wedding, but the wedding is bigger than that. It represents the national unity of the Palestinians. The Palestinians are using their beautiful tradition to wed their sons and daughters. The Islamic Jihad movement and the Gaza Mosque Coalition organized the wedding, confirming that the Palestinian resistance factions have more duties other than resisting the occupation. They also have to bring back happiness to the hearts of the Palestinians, which the Israeli occupation has taken away from them for many long years. They are living in an extremely difficult economic situation because of the occupation, which forced thousands of Palestinians to postpone their weddings. This group wedding shows that the Islamic Jihad movement cares about all aspects of Palestinian lives. We are fighting the enemy and at the same time we are trying to ease the suffering of our people. We want to help young couples get married in this difficult economic situation. We are adding more Palestinian families to our society so we can continue our road of struggle and jihad, God willing. This wedding coincided with the happy occasion of the anticipated Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. God willing, the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza will be the beginning of their withdrawal from all our Palestinian land. God willing. Is this group wedding a basic Palestinian survival instinct, or is it an attempt to be happy? Israel may have its nuclear bombs, but these weddings will enable the Palestinians to produce what they call human bombs, which one day will ultimately tell the demographic balance to their advantage. Mustafa Abdel Hadi, Al Alam Television, Gaza, Palestine. The views expressed on Mosaic are not those of Link TV or its sponsors but of the broadcasters themselves. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation and Henry and Virgilia Dakin.